Good afternoon and welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us for this webinar this afternoon. We have several attendees and we're very excited to have all of you on to discuss um, identifying and assisting elementary and middle school students struggling with mathematics um, and listening to experts to give you advice on how to address this issue in your classroom. Being a former math teacher, I know how important these issues are and I look forward to the comments from our speakers today. Uh, just a couple of things to um, go over the WebEx instructions. Uh, Suzanne covered most of this information, but you know attendees can provide nonverbal feedback to presenters using the feedback tool. Um, here are some of the feedback options that you can share with us if you um, feel the need to do that. There are also uh, there are two polls in this webinar, and responses to the poll questions can be entered into the polling panel. And just be sure that you click Submit so that we do receive your answers. Attendees should utilize the question and answer uh, feature to pose questions to the speaker and panelist um, and or the host. And um, we will look for those questions. Um, because of the high attendance, we may not be able to answer every single question that comes in. But we will select questions for um, discussion after each section of the agenda, and then additional questions will be answered and we will follow up with you and get that information to you following today's webinar. So again, welcome. Uh, we are glad that you've joined us today and look forward to um, our discussion around mathematics. Just first of all, our sponsoring group is REL Appalachia. They are one of 10 RELs across the country. And uh, the REL program, if you are not familiar, is administered by the US Department of Education Institute of Education Sciences. And a REL uh, serves the education needs of a designated region. And we work in partnership with school districts, state departments of education, and others to use data and research to improve academic outcome for students. Um, you can see the map on your screen, and we represent the gray area, which is REL Appalachia, which services Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Uh, we may have attendees from other locations on this webinar, and um, we welcome them to our discussion as well. The mission of REL Appalachia is to meet the applied research and technical assistance needs of the four uh, states that we focus on and the, that we work with. We conduct empirical research and analysis, and we bring evidence-based information to policymakers and practitioners. Um, we inform policy and practice for states, districts, schools, and other stakeholders, and we focus on high-priority discrete issues and build a body of knowledge over time. Our web address is listed on the screen, as well as our Twitter um, address, and we hope that you will consider following us on Twitter to stay up to date with the activities um, going on in REL Appalachia. So today's webinar, we have two speakers. Uh, Russell Gersten is our first speaker, and he is the Executive Director of the Instructional Research Group in Cal Los Alamitos, California, and he is Professor Emeritus at the College of Education at the University of Oregon. Following Dr. Gersten, we will have um, Dr. John Woodward joining us. And he is the IES Practice Guide Panel Chair, and he is the Dean at the School of Education at the University of Puget Sound. Um, John recently um, conducted and participated in a bridge event in Louisville, Kentucky, actually on November 5th, and shared um, a great deal of information from the Practice Guide with us. and. Um, the participants found that to be very, very helpful and meaningful, and we look forward to both speakers sharing with us today. The goals of the webinar are to equip and help elementary and middle school teachers and curriculum coaches with IES-approved research-based recommendations for identifying students struggling with mathematics, and also to provide guidance on strengthening mathematics instruction and support of these students. The agenda, we will first look at what is response to intervention, why use RTI and mathematics instruction, go over the recommendations, 
talk about applications from the practice guide in the classroom, and then have wrap-up and closing remarks. This webinar will last until 5.30, and we will cover the information as indicated on the agenda on your screen. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker. And first of all, Dr. Gerson, thank you for being with us. And I will now turn it over to him to begin the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Ladada. I want to welcome you here. And I think you saw on the agenda the three segments of my talk. And what I'll do is um, after each segment, uh, the first two will be briefer than the third one. I will open things up for questions. And then as um, you've heard, you can just email in in that panel below any questions you have. If one comes to mind, in the middle of any remarks I'm making, just um, email it in, and then during the question time, the the folks at the at the rel will um, you know mention it to me, and we can discuss that because we do have time programmed for that. First, I'm going to talk about what is response to intervention, with the understanding many of you have some familiarity with RTI, and what I'm going to talk about is current thinking as we know it both from developing the practice guide, which I chaired about five years ago, as well as from doing presentations around the country and getting questions about what's happening in the field in elementary, mid-school, and um, following the new re the RTI Center at American Institutes for Research is also a good, has been doing a lot of work and really focusing on the multiple tier system of support or RTI. So some of this will be familiar and I'll do that pretty quickly. This first thing, uh, these, are, these are the famous inverted triangles, which I think there was a while I stopped showing them because people had OD'd on them. I think after the last passage of special ed, um, legislation, states were urged to implement RTI. It appears that every state did it, and people were going around the country with these triangles. Um, the first one is Tier 1, and the RTI, as some of you know, comes from a mix of public health and mental health, and people have perhaps a little force-fed it into education. Tier 1 normally means general preventative measures. So it's everything um, from little brochures you may see in the doctor's office to the kind of things that come on CNN when there's health to things in the newspapers to different, uh, different things that were done for the general population to decrease smoking since the 1960s, especially uh, since the 80s. Uh, there are general things. It's come to mean in education the core classroom instruction. And no two experts define Tier 1 exactly. Some say it only is evidence-based practices. Others say, well, there's a lot of areas we don't have clear evidence. In the area of math education, it's particularly true. So um, it's high-quality instruction. But then you get into what exactly is high-quality. It is not well-defined. People are certainly working on it with observation systems that have been um, piloted and studied with the Gates Foundation, but it is not crystal clear. We have a clear idea of things that aren't working, and we know that both from kids' assessment scores and from just looking in rooms when kids aren't engaged, when the lesson seems to be meandering, when there are mathematical errors being made, but we have a lot we don't know about Tier 1, and which is why I would urge folks, there are some consultants who will come out and saying, first, get Tier 1 you know, up to standards, and only then work on Tier 2. Well, in some ways, to have high-quality math instruction in every classroom, it could take decades for a variety of reasons. Same is true for literacy. So. I would urge, and I think many do, to simultaneously work on the, all the tiers um, and not just drop any one component. But it's certainly true that 
better the quality of instruction. The more it's coherent and makes sense, especially to kids in the lower half, let's say, of the math class, the better it is. Um, Typic, one thing with uh, that does come from health and does carry out, um, carry over to education is universal screening, which is a key component of RTI. That the screening is not only done by teacher judgment. That there's some valid screening battery or measure that's used in the beginning of the year, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Again, I doubt this is surprising uh, to many of you. Um, to improve tier two, um, tier one rather, what many urge is professional development, especially that targets areas that the state assessments or end of course tests or whatever benchmark tests are being used show are weak areas, which could be well be fractions, base ten. Decimals as kids are older, um, obviously a lot of struggles in algebra and pre-algebra. So that is another possible way uh, to bulk up Tier 1. Um, now these will be linked with the Common Core, but um, that makes sense. Differentiated instruction has been urged, which is spending time with so that the material with kids so that the material is accessible both to those who quickly grasp an intuitive math and to those who take more time, more explanation, more discussion. And to some, it's scientifically based math instruction, but there are some areas where we have a nice space, but many, many more areas in math where we don't. Here, too, is a bit easier to define. It's taking a group of students who are at risk based on your screening measure and providing them with some level of support. It's usually done in small groups, occasionally individually. It's probably a good idea to do it in small groups in most cases. Groups typically run about four kids or four to six, and that seems like it should be about the limit, because otherwise kids are no longer getting, um, getting instruction that makes sense to them, and you're likely to run into all kinds of problems with the group being too heterogeneous, with attention problems, et cetera. Um, tier two is meant to not be a remedial program, but a support program. And by that, the idea would be, in a lot of ways, you're giving kids, it might be three days a week, even daily, period of time, maybe a half hour, maybe 20 minutes, maybe in middle school, certainly a whole 45-minute period, to really make sure that they're getting the grade level material, be they third graders or seventh graders. And that approach, there's some evidence that it does work. What often is done is activities are developed so kids ideally have more of a chance to interact and get feedback because now you have an adult with only four to six kids and it's harder to kind of escape or get lost. The idea of the long block of independent work time does not usually work well for kids who are struggling and this way kids can um, do small groups of problems, work on problems with a partner and discuss, and one of the things we envision in Tier 2, and it will come up strongly in the practice guide, is giving kids a chance to talk about math. And in many cases, this will be a pretty new experience, and they'll have a lot of learning to do in terms of the more formal academic language we use. But that is where uh, Tier 2 intervention can be an art. Um, what we recommend it, and I think it makes perfect sense, is to strategically backtrack. So what you don't want to do is take an eighth grader and give him a kind of remedial uh, program that covers fourth and fifth grade material, because then there, the other students are working on proportion and pre-algebra and rate problems, and they're off 
learn, trying to learn yet again long division and multi-digit multiplication. And um, years and years ago, John Woodward and I, who worked together for a long time, observed some of these um, basic algebra and remedial courses. And when you do that kind of thing, it is deadly for kids. So here it's more strategic. So if you're do, working on fractions in fourth grade or third grade, a lot of review of multiplication facts and multiplication in general is a good idea because when you talk about equivalent fractions, being fluent with multiplication facts is really critical. Um, and monitoring students is important in terms of monitoring how they're doing. Um, I'm not going to have much time, and John may have thoughts on this too. Many of the progress monitoring measures we have after K and 1 are often far from ideal um, because they're not tapping the full range of things that the Common Core and many current state standards um, cover, and that's the main reason. And we had, do not have a lot of updated validity information. Um, since the practice guide came out, and that's why these studies aren't in, in there, there have been a set of about five of the studies. One was from one of the regional labs, the Southwest Lab, which was, is, was and is housed in Texas, and showing that this approach, where you're basically Honing in, especially on the more difficult aspects of grade level material and in first grade, it's really giving kids a good, strong foundation in number and number line in fourth grade. It's fractions as a key area that those effects, those programs can work and can lead to kids doing a lot better on a wide array of relevant measures. Um, Another thing that you'll be hearing more and more about is executive functions and working memory. And working memory does play a role in, in math. Um, I think the field needs to do a little more work in how to um, incorporate this into instruction. But basically, the, what this is, kids who have a hard time maintaining several pieces of abstract information in their head is how I look at working memory. But basically, some of those kids may need even more time than their peers. And there are some measures of it that aren't that hard to administer. But that could be part of its screening battery, should not be the end all and be all. And um, one thing to consider, and I, I imagine many of you have heard, is you want to look if kids are Growing, and if they're not if they're not growing in their regular classroom, and the slope is flat, you might want to consider tier two. And if they're not grow, growing in tier two, you may want to consider um, more intensive or tier three interventions. The only problem is um, with that is that it takes about twelve data points. Recent research has shown to get a stable slope. So that's, in most cases, a long, long wait. That's a good third of a school year. So I think there are huge potentials in using uh, level testing, computer-assisted testing, to monitor progress in new ways beyond what people are currently advocating. And that's something we can discuss a little during Q&A, which it's time for now, and I think I'll, yes. I'll turn things over to um, Ladada and see if she has any questions. Yes, we do, Russell. And for the sake of time and to keep us on track, I'm just going to select one of those for now. But we will get responses to the other questions and send that out to our participants. But one of the questions that came in, um, Lori Randall asked, what do you use to, to progress monitor Tier 2 students? OK. Uh, that's that's a question. In, I think in the elementary grades, I mean, excuse me, in the primary grades, we do have some measures that will do that. A particularly good one is a magnitude comparison by first grade, simple computation problems. Speeded is just a good, quick, uh, 
gauge. As you get older, there are measures available from various commercial publishers. Uh, they tend to somewhat correlate with standardized achievement tests and state assessments. It's not perfectly clear what to use. I would tend to use a mix of things. I'd use the various unit tests that come with the curriculum. Uh, there, there are some problems that basically, and I think we all know, some unit tests are simply easier or harder than others. So it isn't great to have a clear cutoff score there. I would also investigate, and I think there'll be more products out in the very near future, anything that's um, leveled so you can really get a sense of our kids making progress in math. Because for some kids who are receiving intervention, some of the extra work they're doing in terms of um, doing a lot more math may simply build fluency and may, they may, you may find effects in an array of skills. So we go to the next question. Um, well, maybe we should go on to the next set of slides. Sure. I think we should do that, but we will get answers to you for all of the questions. So sure. Russell, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just answer them late, later if need be by email. Yes. Yeah. OK. okay. So let's go on, and I will. I know my. T I have time limits, so. Um, so this is why use RTI in mathematics, and here the research is now a lot clearer. Um, for young students, we know a few things. One is the kids in kindergarten who start low, who start with very minimal knowledge of numbers. So even which number is bigger, four or six, they're struggling with even, you know, just identifying small numbers, numbers less than 10, the teens. They, they can't really do much. Kids who start kindergarten low and end kindergarten low using a huge nationally representative database, we know that those students tend to do badly even in the fifth grade. So there's a sense that in kindergarten, there can be leveling of the playing field. There may be kids who did not attend preschool and did not have a home where numbers were talked about. But once they get to kindergarten and there are numbers all around and their math activities, if they do well there, that's a good omen. But we know failure to, failure to thrive, to use a medical term, in kindergarten in math is an indicator this kid needs monitoring. So this would be a kid you'd want to monitor more carefully using an array of measures. Um, and um, it actually, oddly, the kindergarten math performance predicts subsequent reading better than um, the read kindergarten um, reading performance. Of course, you can actually do a lot with numbers in math, but usually in kindergarten, you're doing a lot of reading-related skills. So I take that with a grain of salt. So what's called reading is a lot with phonemes, basic sounds. And um, the kids rated as uh, inattentive a lot of the time. That augured poorly for them doing well in math. So again, a kid, um, and much more so than reading. So that is something, a way to use the kindergarten data you have in a school for kids who might need to tracking afterwards. Um, in terms of building math, um, a model of what it takes to do well in math it's for young kids, attention and working memory seem to be two, two things that um, play a role. Okay, and those are more things school psychologists know about. But there are quick measures of those. And it's a good way to get a rich picture. But the other one is the development of a mental number line is probably in throughout elementary grades a key component. And the kids with more sophisticated number lines um, tend to have a better, deeper knowledge of mathematics. And number line will be a big theme in what I talk about. And you'll see that in the intermediate grades a bit. Here, though, the focus, especially in grades four and five, needs fractions. I was a member of the National Math Panel, and we said that at that point. Um, 
in time, and um, it was based only on a mathematical an analysis that there is a level of abstractions in, in fractions that is significantly different than anything having to do with whole number arithmetic. And kids need to make that leap into this more abstract world of fractions. Fractions can be either, uh, you know, the, sometimes the larger the numbers you see in front of you, the fraction may be smaller. There are a lot of counterintuitive things. And successfully making that loop is, is critical. And it's why, in some ways, fractions increasingly have seen as every bit as much of a gateway as um, algebra, because if knowing fractions is essential for doing well in algebra. And that was confirmed by surveys done by the National Math Panel of algebra teachers in terms of the, key, the kids who struggle what is their problem, and the key was not knowing fractions. So the other thing the more recent data shows is the kids' knowledge in fifth grade um, is uh, key to um, how well they do in algebra. It predicts more than their computation ability, than any other measure of math. Um, the NAEP, um, uh, Okay, okay. This is the problem. I'm going to show it to you. And maybe, um, you know, because of time, I'm not going to have you do it, but maybe I'll at least just not do a formal poll, uh, Jennifer, because um, the time limits. But this is a problem from the NAEP where kids had to, I, now this was given to eighth graders, have to, to identify these three fractions. Oops. The three, three fractions have disappeared from the screen. So that one, I think we're just going to skip because the fractions are gone. I don't know what happened. Um, so this was my second briefer study about why use RTI, because kids who don't get what number is about in kindergarten if you intervene early, that you could get them on the right track. Kindergarten's a great time to do it. First grade is not too late. And the key then is looking in grades four through seven. Do kids really understand fractions? And again, sorry for the disappearing uh, NAEP items, but the data showed half the kids in the eighth grade in the U.S. flunked the item, that they couldn't put three pretty basic fractions in the right sequence, right order, in terms of big to small. So misperceptions about fractions persist. This is the heart of the practice guide. And here I do have a polling question. This is what it looks like. And Ladata will show you the link in a little bit. These were the panelists. And just some of you may know some of them or of their work. We cut across special ed, math ed, um, research mathematician and cognitive psych. Um, the main thing we tried to do there is really pull together the research, which was rigorously reviewed, but also the best thinking about how can we think about what was then a pretty new field, RTI and math. And can we do something that's coherent, that the different things we say fit together? And John may um, allude to that theme when he talks about the practical or practice end. So we give broad recommendations and then some specific suggestions. And we talk about level of evidence. And this makes this different than most other guides for educators that might come out by NCTM, ASCD, IRA, CEC, whatever, because we have a rigorous review of the evidence. And there's clear standards that I can't go into in detail here. That could be something if people are interested, they could let the, the REL know. But we also deal with potential roadblocks that a math specialist and RTI coordinator will face. And the evidence is rated strong, moderate, and low based on the number of rigorous randomized trials or rigorous evaluation studies. And these are reviewed independently. The panelists themselves can read as many as they want, but they don't actually do the scientific review that's done by folks that we supervise. 
This is the set of eight recommendations that we thought a school would need, not to set them up all at once in one year, but to have a successful RTI program. And the level of scientific evidence is listed next to it. And you see there is a range. Some are strong, some moderate, and some low. Kind of have a nice, kind of even spread, pretty much. What I'd like you to do is look at these for a couple of minutes. And I'll put them back on the screen in a second. But tell you which level of evidence is the biggest surprise to you. So just do that and just enter the number in, in a poll. And I'll give you about two minutes. And um, uh, yeah, and Ladada has it, and Jennifer have it set up for you. So we'll give you about two minutes for that. The poll has ended, and it's going to take them about 20 seconds to tabulate. But I'll, while, we'll do, while we do that, um, I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do now, and we'll discuss the poll results. But I'm going to target just a few of the areas in the practice guide. There's never enough time to do all of it and give you a flavor of what it's like, um, and which will, of course, set the stage for uh, the pa panelists, which is John Woodward. Um, universal screening and progress monitoring uh, come up. Uh, universal screening, we thought there was about moderate evidence. It's strongest in the primary grades, where we have a little bit more theory because we know things linked to the number line and just developing a sense of quantity and comparing magnitudes is really essential. Um, when we get older, um, it seems some of the work, and I listed Bob Siegler on the slide, some of his work um, supports the idea that number line measures continue to be good predictors and good ways for a quick screen of kids. Um, so uh, that is why um, we say it's moderate evidence. Um, Progress monitoring, a lot of the validity and the quality of the measures um, are, is, not, is not known well enough to say what's out there now are high quality progress monitoring. That may be some people may tell you otherwise, but that's what we concluded. Um, can we share the poll results? Uh, Jennifer, is there anything that there might be to share? Suzanne, will you share the poll results, please? So if these were set up as open-ended questions. The poll results are not shareable in the WebEx. Oh, OK, OK. Um, uh, OK, OK. I wasn't aware of that. Um, uh, OK, so this is an example of the measure Bob Siegler has used with so much success. It's simply, and it seems hard at first, but this is what they do. This is the a whole level, a whole, to me, a whole number, number line thing that could be done with second graders, for example. What we just ask the student to do is, and this is usually done on computer, it can be done paper and pencil, is you just ask them, best they can, where does 87 go? And you just give them 0 to 100. And you give them a set of perhaps a dozen 
and you look at the distance, which a computer does instantly, you look at the distance um, between the two, um, between where he put, the child put 87, and where um, 87 is actually done, you know, with, with careful measurement. And you actually, the score that the, the computer uses is the absolute value of the difference. So a student, for example, who put 87 in what actually is 90% of the way there would get a score of 3, which would be considered an excellent score. And you can do this up to 1,000 with older kids. You could do it with fractions. But this measure is the most powerful predictor of how kids do, and this includes how they do in algebra in the eighth grade when this kind of thing is given to fifth grade. So this is one of the most powerful ways to do to do it. Another uh, simpler way to do this, and it's usually done with younger students, is you just give them a whole set of things, and they go through quite a bit um, quickly, and just ask them to circle the biggest number. And um, <clears throat> that also works really well for screening. So that is just a real simple update on what we're doing in screening. In terms of what to teach, we really had no evidence. We just had the expert panel's opinions and a little bit extrapolation. There have been now a couple of studies by Bob Siegler who makes the point that um, Good instruction is neither all computation, all word problem, and then some days concepts. Rather than doing them segregated, if they are integrated, it works better. Not every single day, but if they are integrated, as well as the fact that as students gain in computation, they understand mathematical ideas better. For example, kids may have a basic understanding of the commutative um, property of addition when they're, um, when they're in first grade, but the level they're going to get by the time they're in fifth grade and dealing with long division is a much, or fifth and sixth grade, is going to be so much deeper. So as instructors, and this is especially true working with intervention students, to realize that they are um, linked together. The only reason I put Singapore math in is when you look at Singapore math, it's different than many American textbooks because computation and picture problems are merged starting in first grade. And once you see that, you figure, why go back? It just this seems so much of a better way to teach. You know, the way a dozen word problems for homework is tedious and boring, and a dozen computation problems are boring. But what kids start to do is they get to see context. So we think that's what a good intervention curriculum would have. Um, the the as far as possible, linking them to grade level standards. It does get harder and harder as you go up the grade, but the idea of strategic coverage of foundational things, multiplication facts when you're doing basic ideas with equivalence, review of the equal sign as it relates to whole number when you're doing equivalent fractions, and that kind of thing is key. Um, Given the uh, relatively short amount of time we have, I'm going to do go through this fairly quickly. The um, and you can read through it in a second. Well, we concluded, and a lot of the scouring through the studies. So I didn't actually do the um, kind of methodological analysis, though I would clarify uh, points and terminology, and the same was true when John uh, chair. But I really read carefully studies to see if they supported um, what we were saying. And basically, when we looked at the intervention studies, the key thing that was there was were two, well, were really one component. They were very, very systematic. Kids got sufficient practice. There was tons of review. They were always given sets 
that were mixed, so they had to think a little more. So if they were, um, they might do equivalence problems and addition problems together, or addition and subtraction of problems on the same day. So they're really having to think more. So anything to make things such that kids really start to feel comfortable and feel that they've really learned it. The rate at which the regular class goes is too fast for some kids. Having this extra private time to practice and to begin to talk about math, and that's the area the panel felt very strongly. Trying to verbalize the thinking process is critical for kids and intervention, saving interventions, and it rarely happens. Um, some of the things that seemed most supportive, um, the only other ones were um, extensive practice, which I mentioned. I believe, and this is my way of framing it, not in the studies, kids have to give you reasons for what they're doing. And that starts to slowly build a habit of them thinking and beginning to reason mathematically, which is stressed heavily in the math practice standards. And probably what we don't know, and I'll end things here because my time is just about up and I've covered the main points, is how do you set up when you have at-risk kids ways to support kids talking about their thinking and problem-solving strategies? How can you do that? And the other thing is, how do you organize that kind of mathematical discussion that can happen in heterogeneous classrooms when you only have four students who are in the lowest third or so in their school? So those are issues I see the next wave of research um, addressing. And with that, I'll see if I have a couple of minutes for questions, or if not, turn things over to John. So. Ladada, you can inform us. OK. Uh, we do have some questions. First off, um, we have multiple questions about the copy of the slideshow. The um, presentation will be posted to the REL Appalachia website and will be available to you there. So that takes care of a number of our questions. Um, one question, um, are there intervention kits available with this program? And then another question, uh, Russell, is how can I help my second grade students improve their mental number line? And the intervention kits, I think that was with your earlier discussion. And so that might be a yes or no if there are ones available. Yeah. And then can yeah, I help there are ones involved. Because this is a federal grant, um, federal contract, we can't recommend any. But there are things available. And I think you can use some of these things we are uh, talking about as criteria to review them and look at them. And in terms of how do you support developing a, a mental number line, I would see um, two things. One is a lot of work on the number line, much more than is in, in many current textbooks. Uh, and you might be able to add supplemental things. So there's more number line work. So subtraction, kids are seeing it on a number line. Another thing that I think many of us learn from Korean, Singapore, math, other Asian math programs is the use of strip diagrams. And I think I have a picture of one which I did not get to. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll poll for that. But let me just tell you what they are. They are they're skinny rectangles. You know, we tend to do fractions as part of a whole or parts of several holes or several, several units. And um, the, main, the main thing is um, that uh, if you do it on a, on a very skinny rectangle rather than the circle, kids have an easier time moving from a skinny rectangle, which I'll find in a second to um, to a number line. And I think using them is great. This is also a way you can do cute things with number lines. This is what I was aiming for, that you could actually, this is the kind of thing you could do in fifth grade when you do a lot of fractions computation on a number line. But 
Um, you can also um, use strip diagrams, which are very, very skinny rectangles, and kids have an easy time fading to a number line from that. And it's probably time for me to wrap up, I believe, Ladada, correct? Yes, uh, we have a little flexibility. One other question that I will sure. um, have you answer. This question is from Natalie, and why hasn't the U.S. adopted the Singapore math if it is seemingly better and more effective? Do we have access to it? Um, we haven't. No one has proved that Singapore math, that that program itself, is better than what's currently done in the U.S. One thing that has hampered um, a U.S. adoption is um, the we're used to in the U.S. pretty hefty teachers' guides, manuals, etc. And Singapore's is very, very slender. It assumes a lot of training in math on the part of teachers. That may not be the case in the U.S., but if you certainly want to look at it, there are, or look at any products, just uh, websites, and you could look at math, supplemental math programs, math intervention programs. But Singapore um, is definitely available to look at. We don't know either. Um, you know, it's like the old thing in the poem, the dancer from the dance. We don't know if the fact that their teachers tend to get pretty strong mathematics training, not just a one math methods, teaching methods course. So what role that plays? But I do think we can certainly borrow some of the techniques. The strip diagrams is one, and the um, merging of word problems with uh, computation is the other. And some American programs are likely to have them in there, or should have them in there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gersten. And at this point, we will turn um, the webinar over to Dr. John Woodward to talk about applications uh, from the guide for the classroom. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm now in control of the slide, so I should be able to get to the right place that we need to be. Um, okay. okay, actually, what I want to do is two things. Um, I want to follow up on some points that Russell just finished making, amplify them a bit, and then I'll turn to, with the time that's remaining as much as possible, the slides I've prepared to amplify a lot of what's in um, the RTI guide that Russell spent most of the time uh, talking about. I think the first thing, and this just almost is starting backwards, the first or the last point that Russell was making about the Singapore curriculum, there were some... Um, uh, districts around the country way back, you know, a decade ago when Singapore math was taking off who were infatuated with the idea and tried adopting it and, and uh, didn't have the success they expected. And I think it speaks volumes to the differences between cultures. In the United States, we expect everything to be packaged in a curriculum. And as Russell said, you know, voluminous teacher guides that Quite frankly, most teachers don't have the time at the elementary grades particularly to look at. Uh, and as he's uh, uh, articulated as well, the Singapore guide is, in, or, or the textbooks are incredibly thin, as are most Asian textbooks. And that's because the tilting or the weighting of the uh, the work is done in terms of the teacher knowledge and professional development. And again, without going off into that too much, I mean, there's a whole different kind of teacher preparation system that goes on in a small country like Singapore that's impossible to replicate in the size of the United States, but I think what's true of most Asian countries is that they've, in, particularly in cases like Japan that are pretty well documented, they have a surplus of teachers for the number of positions. The teachers are highly qualified. They get a lot of apprenticeship training, and that helps explain why you know, success with that curriculum is what it is. Um, in terms of the mental number line uh, that... Uh, was asked the question that preceded that. Um, I guess there's a flippant but actually serious answer to that question is, and you could solve the problem by going to the Netherlands. And I say that because uh, you're sending the kids to the Netherlands simply because uh, that country, um, and it's an interesting story, 30, 40 years ago, felt as if it didn't really have 
a uh, successful math curriculum and, and essentially solicited experts from around the world to construct a curriculum that they thought would be most effective. And the intriguing story, and it's been documented with their success on international studies or comparison studies like the Thames, uh, the interesting story there is they've embedded the number line deeply across all the elementary grade levels and right up through middle school. So it's, you know, again, a point that Russell was making. These kinds of tools have to be used much more consistently than uh, what they, you know, may be used in uh, uh, places around the United States. And that country is a really good example of how they've made a heavy, heavy commitment to the number line as a vehicle for communicating a lot of mathematics. Um, I'd also like to sort of make some comments that were made, uh, and again, amplified points that uh, Russell was making earlier in the presentation that I think are, are really worth taking to heart. He started off early on talking about uh, Tier 2 interventions and the, effectively the connection between what students are working on as a follow-up or a complement to what's going on in the regular classroom. And I can't emphasize enough how important that is at Tier 2, but at the same time how difficult it is. Um, probably four years ago, I had the opportunity to do a pretty in-depth evaluation of, of all things, RTI and uh, mathematics education in a large Colorado school district, and uh, in particularly focusing on what was going on at the middle school, high school level. And therein, you had a very clear case of the real challenges most schools face, particularly the high schools face, in trying to coordinate the kind of supplemental tier two services for students who were struggling as they were coming into algebra classes or they were still in pre-algebra classes. And so, you know, the issue about tier two that is so paramount in trying to articulate it, particularly as you go up the grade levels, is the issue of coordination. I mean, optimally, you'd like to have the teacher who were responsible for what was going on in the regular classroom doing the Tier 2, but we know that that's a very difficult thing to, to work out, and the ongoing communication uh, is a significant challenge. Um, the other point that he made about progress monitoring, and I actually had a chance while he was talking to pull up the slides involving the... Uh, the fractions, because they're really, it's a useful example at, at multiple levels. The, the NAEPS item shows that only about half the kids pass this item, and all that it is is ordering fractions in terms of their magnitudes least to greatest, and the fractions are two-sevenths, <coughs> excuse me, one-half, and five-ninths. The nice thing about that task, or what's important about that task, is the issue of magnitude is right there front and center, and we're all the way up into fractions. So the issue that Russell was talking about that is a serious indicator of difficulty at the kindergarten or even pre-kindergarten level, you know, is there right up through our ability to work with fractions. And it also points out to me, and I think this is what he was alluding to, a glaring hole in the progress monitoring instruments that we have today to really effectively understand how kids are able to perform tasks like that, two-sevenths, one-half, five-ninths. It's important to see what kind of strategies they're using to order those fractions in, in their magnitude. And, and it's not something that's easily gleaned even from a simple paper and mass-administered paper and pencil task or test. So uh, it's just an indicator that there's a long way to go in terms of the progress monitoring instruments for even intermediate and certainly middle-grade uh, students. Uh, I'm going to get to the issue of uh, working memory through an example a little bit later on. Uh, but again, I think to come back to one other point that I was jotting some notes on, that issue of the number line, uh, again, as a visual representation, plays out in a huge way, and you see it in the Common Core Standards. One of the things that they recommend, and we've done been doing a little bit of work on it with kids, uh, as a very effective tool for solving ratio proportion problems involves what they call double number lines in the uh, Common Core Standards. And, and again, that's a nice continuation of that kind of imagery in the context of ratios and proportions. Um, another point that he made that, again, merits... Um, uh, I think reinforcing in a, in a significant way is the issue uh, he talked about pretty close to the end of his presentation, of the integration of the conceptual and the procedural understanding. I mean, one of the most clearly endemic problems in special education 
is the wholehearted commitment to procedural competence, procedural competence, procedural competence. And, you know, we've seen so many students, particularly by the time they reach the end of the intermediate grades and certainly in the middle grades, continuing to work on worksheet after worksheet after worksheet. And, you know, from our own work, we found that it's not the matter of the kids know long division or multi-digit multiplication or not, what we do know is that they don't really care much about what they're doing anymore. They're pretty well disengaged. And so that weave or integration of conceptual understanding and procedural competence is really important. And uh, I think a point that I would add to what he was saying as a refinement, it's really important from an instructional point of view is that down the line, it's important to come back to conceptual demonstrations of topics. So for example, if you are at the middle grades and you're working on fractions and you're moving your way in through decimals. It's not a bad idea in the context of decimals as just a warm-up activity coming into the class to have one or two kids explain why it is you have to change the denominators when you add and subtract fractions. Uh, That's a useful way of reminding them that there's sort of conceptual foundations for why math works the way it works. And it's also a way of sponsoring a lot of uh, metacognition and then the work that they do. So with all of that being said, what I think I'm going to try to do in the remaining uh, 15 minutes or so is move through some further examples that are taken from the guide. Uh, Perhaps some of you might be a little confused about referring to us being panel chairs on the guide, just to make it clear to the audience out there. Russell was the panel chair for the RTI guide, which is the predominant uh, you know, focus, obviously, of this presentation. You can see on the screen before you, I was a panel chair on the Improving Math Problem Solving uh, Guide, grades 4 through 8. Now, this guide was not focused exclusively by any means on struggling students. There was special education literature and research studies that were accommodated into the guide, and so there's the mapping of these two topics is is not you know one to one it's not right right on top of each other. so a lot of the statements that are being made in the guide that complement what's in the r t i guide uh, you know have to be thought of as such that they apply to general education students and possibly at times to to special ed students. So what I'm going to focus on as a mode of amplifying some of his points, again with time remaining, I'm going to start off and talk about some points he raised around systematic focus instruction as well as solving word problems for which you can see there is strong evidence. And then with time remaining, I'm going to get to try to get to, to recommendations five and six, the role of visual representations and also the um, building of fluency with basic arithmetic facts. Uh, As he already said, there was strong evidence for this issue of verbalization of thought processes. And and that is, as he's absolutely right about, is brand new stuff for a lot of kids. Uh, The work we did in the 1990s, looking at kids in regular classrooms who were struggling at the late uh, primary grades, certainly the intermediate grades, those kids who, in a context of a classroom where classroom discussions were occurring, virtually never talked at all. So you could go through an entire semester, if not a year, and them volunteering an answer, them talking aloud. And when they were asked to make a contribution, you could pretty well count only the one or two words that they said. This is not something that that, uh, struggling students are used to. And it becomes no surprise that you know, while that's an important practice, it's not clear how this kind of thing is conducted. And so, you know, in terms of the slides that he uh, already presented, the extensive feedback is going to be important. Providing the rationale is, of course, very important. But in terms of unresolved issues around explicit instruction, uh, this is really much more where you get into the art rather than the science at this point in time. And I do concur and hope that, as he suggested, the next wave of research going on you know, with at-risk learners and special ed kids is around this issue of how do you conduct peer discussions. And it's it's no small problem when you have a group, you know, when kids are homogeneously grouped, um, just as a, again, a personal bit of research, we found some success in doing this with what was called ad hoc grouping, where we kind of clustered together five, six, maybe nine struggling students and a, and a teacher running small group discussions. But, you know, that was sort of preliminary research at best. Nonetheless, 
it was a condition in which it was very easy to have all kids contribute and then contribute uh, in you know quite a significant level. Um, going to the problem solving guide itself, there is a cautionary reminder about problems. In the context of the RTI guide, for the most part, they looked at word problems that were really about operations. And that's certainly one type of problem, but there are also problems, of course, the further on you get up uh, in schools, uh, middle school, for sure, you get a lot of geometry and measurement problems that, you know, play out in a slightly different way for sure than word problems do. And then, of course, there's always the log <coughs> excuse me, logic, uh, puzzle problems, visual problems, those kinds of problems that uh, can be used just to develop strategic thinking. So uh, it's just a point, a point to keep in mind. One thing, though, that we did try to cover in the context of the problem-solving guide that does pertain to the RTI guide is a recommendation that was actually minimal in evidence for pretty obvious reasons. The recommendation had to do with preparing the problems that you're going to use for whole classroom instruction. That's not an arena where people are going to be doing a lot of experimental research. Nonetheless, we felt that for the ELL audience, for the at-risk audience, for kids in special education, this really was an incredibly important consideration. How many problems? What's the purpose of the problems? How do we have to modify the problems to the cultural or linguistic background of the students? These are critical considerations that need to come into play and I think are fair in the way that they certainly link with uh, the recommendation of looking at the underlying structure of word problems that's found in the RTI guide. So as you can see through this example, for some kids, and this may apply as much to ELL as it might be just to any kids in a cultural context, a yacht sailing five miles an hour, the current, uh, a slip, a harbor, those words obviously may not have any meaning at all to the audience uh, that we're talking about and the length of the problem, the number of distractors, those set of factors are all considerations in terms of modifying word problems to make them work uh, effectively with the audience that um, we're talking about. Uh, the issue that probably was one of the central discussion points and follows up on this concern that Russell already articulated about how do you get classroom discussions to work, how you get kids to present the rationale for their thinking, there is, I think, some evidence that certainly would apply in a special ed context for the importance for not only kids to be able to present their rash rationales, but also for teachers to model and talk aloud in terms of how they would go about solving a problem themselves. And as obvious as this recommendation may be, it's just stunning the lack of occasions in which this kind of thing actually occurs. I mean, the opportunity for a teacher could simply say out loud, you know, here's the kind of thing I would think about, here's how I would go about it. You know, I might even ask myself, how is this problem related to other problems that we've been working on? How is it different? Uh, those kinds of talk aloud questions are incredibly powerful models for kids to be able to hear uh, and so that they can adopt those as questions that they can ask themselves uh, at some point, hopefully independently. Certainly, and this again is part of the discussion that fits in with what we want teachers to do and don't want to do, this personally I feel is a problem that abounds in some of the special education literature, particularly if you go back a couple of decades, and that is the adherence to a pretty broad or generic strategy of reading the problem, finding a strategy, solving the problem, and evaluating it. This stems from Polya's work back in the late 1940s or 50s, I've forgotten which decade, but in any event, just presenting and having kids memorize this kind of strategy, and the strategy, as you can see, uh, involves usually making a drawing, very easy to memorize, very unclear whether this kind of approach is going to be effective, particularly as you get into word problems that have lots of complexity associated with them. So this is the kind of script or structure that we wanted to avoid. What we did include in the problem solving guide, and, and I guess we should say these things are you know federal documents. They're available for free from IES. You can just Google for them and find uh, both guides uh, for free. But these are the kinds of questions that we would like teachers to be able to to 
talk about and talk out loud and you know uh, what I know about the problem, the information that's relevant, its similarity to previous problems. Uh, another example that again can be found in the guide, uh, various approaches that I might use making sense of the solution. This, and this, by the way, this does the solution make sense? How can I check? This is part of the evaluation step, but, you know, it's important there that time is accorded to where kids actually do take time to look at their work, ask themselves that question, perhaps explain it to another. It's very easy to say evaluate your work, but, you know, kids in the context of trying to solve multiple problems usually skip that step. So these are things that that certainly merit uh, modeling and paying attention to. And the last one, I think, is a critical one as well. If you've done a good job in problem solving, oftentimes you learn strategies that are not effective, that don't work. And so this last question of what do I do differently next time is as important as anything else, particularly to reinforce the fact that in some occasions some strategies work and some strategies don't. I'd like to now turn my attention to the uh, issue of visual representations, and Russell was saying much earlier on about the issue of working memory. So I'm going to give you a task for just one moment that's going to really bring home this issue of the complexity of uh, working memory. This is where the evidence in the uh, RTI guide uh, found to be moderate levels of evidence. He showed you very briefly the slides where visual representations are important in teaching concepts, but they also can be very important in the context of um, helping kids solve problems. The thing that they can do, the visual representations, is they can significantly decrease the cognitive load. And the cognitive load, a pretty fancy you know, cognitive psychology term, comes in in terms of kids having to juggle and hold all this information in working memory. This is the example that I'm working toward. If you can just spend a second, read the problem. I don't care about you answering the problem. I, the problem is written in a way for adults to appreciate how difficult it is to register and work with all of this information at once. So I'm going to give you about a minute or a little bit less perhaps, just to ask yourself, how, why is this so challenging? What is it that I have to juggle in order to figure it out if, in fact, all I'm going to rely on to work this problem is just reading it? I don't have any other tools accessible. So I think you can appreciate that, you know, you've got numbers here, you've got numbers or quantities that are in relation to other quantities, stuff that's at the very core of solving problems. And the question that arises is, how can a visual representation help? Well, to, um, you know, depart and go back to special education strategies um, a decade or so ago, We've got a difference, in, and Russell talked about strip diagrams, but there's this another entity that sometimes is talked about that comes from Singapore called tape diagrams that we feel as tools for helping understanding concepts and certainly for helping, in this case, solve word problems are far superior than to do something that just involves a picture. And here's the problem with pictures. If you go back to the old style special ed research where it was usually draw a picture, as you can see, the pictures are not terribly helpful at all, not terribly attractive either. So we're no further ahead by drawing pictures of these objects, a coat, a sweater, than we were just by reading the problem itself. And for a lot of kids who lack the persistence, this may the, be the beginning of the end in terms of them being able to solve the problem, frustration level arising to the point that they're clueless and then it's off to just reverting to adding those two fractions, if that's what makes sense, taking one-third of $150 and calling it $50 and then moving on to the next problem. Here is, and again, this underscores a point that Russell made earlier, the issue of, as he said, with number lines, but applies as well to tape diagrams, selecting a model, 
sticking with it, using it in multiple contexts. In fact, you could make the argument that you may want to use, not necessarily this kind of a problem, but a problem, a word problem, after they've used tape diagrams in other contexts just to show how the tape diagram is used in this particular context. And what you can see is the diagram helps kids see the, the problem solver, see the relationship between the fifths, and then what become the thirds, what she had remaining. So there are the two fifths that are spent on the coat. The three fifths now really becomes the remaining quantity, and that is re uh, conceptualized as the whole that's remaining or the three thirds. That's a significant shift in thinking. Uh, in itself, and it's sponsored by the opportunity to display this thing with a very clean, nice representation called a tape diagram. That said, you need a lot of practice using these diagrams to make them successful, even in this kind of a context. And so once you isolate the one-third of the three-thirds that's presented there in the tape diagram, the rest of it is all calculations. I'm trying to be deferential to time, and so I'm going to conclude in the last minute or so by talking about a sixth point, or the sixth recommendation that's made in the guide, and it's building this fluency with arithmetic facts. There is, of course, it seems nothing important or new to be said about teaching math facts by themselves. Well, we do 10, and we practice the facts kids don't know, and that should be it at the end of the day. There's other thinking, and it pervades the math literature. I won't. I have no time to get into this point, but it involves the combination of teaching kids strategies as well as timed practice on facts. It's very well documented that low-achieving kids, kids in special education, don't reach the time criterion needed to have fluency in facts and need practice for that very purpose. But there's a powerful way in which strategies can be folded into this thinking about achieving this time practice. And I'll just give you one simple example. The worst nightmare in learning facts isn't necessarily the multiplication facts that everybody talks about. Think about how onerous it is to learn subtraction facts. So you take something like 16 minus 9, or 15 minus 7, or 14 minus 5. Those are all seen by kids as completely independent, isolated bits of information. And a really great strategy that is an Asian strategy is what's called a through 10. It's why being able to decompose numbers taught early on in the primary grades is so important as it plays out in learning your facts so that you start to see something like 16 minus 9 as 16 minus 6 minus 3 more, and it's a going through 10 kind of strategy. So 14 minus 5 is 14 minus 4 minus 1 more. Initially, learning the strategies for facts can be engaging to kids, and then they can become an overarching strategy for attacking a whole series of teen fact subtraction problems that otherwise would be isolated bits of information. And so that kind of strategic thinking, and that's basically all I can say about it at this time, it's actually alluded to in a study in the RTI guide if you want to follow up further, but that kind of thinking is very, very important for achieving a critical goal for kids uh, who are in special education and struggling, struggling with their basic facts, because as Russell said earlier, you can't get to fractions, much less to coefficients and algebraic equations, not knowing facts. When you stumble on those, everything slows down. Mostly things fall apart. I have about 2.16, so I'm a little bit beyond my time, but without a, we have time for some questions, perhaps? Yes. Yes, I think we have time for questions. Um, and I'm just going to start kind of working through some of the comments and questions that have been made. Um, Jill mentioned that Singapore math um, uses some of this information, the material that you just covered. Mm -hmm. um, one question from Anne Marie is this is the problem solving guide part of the IT, RTI guide? No, they're entirely, entirely separate guides. They both can be found at the IES website, and I think the easiest way to do it is to, to Google IES and then either RTI guide or problem solving guide, and it should appear okay. in the search. And um, a 
someone asked if the audio would be available on the RHEL website. Yes, this webinar has been recorded, and it will be posted on the RHEL AP website um, just as the slides will be. So all of this material will be available to you um, as a follow-up. Another question from Anne-Marie. Uh, Dr. Woodward said at, that ideally it would be the classroom teacher, Tier 1 teacher, that would also provide the Tier 2 instruction. But it is very difficult in all caps. So what's a good plan? Right, and, and this is something actually Russell and I have talked quite a bit about because you can err too far in the direction that uh, I was describing. That is to say the only person who can do this kind of instruction is somebody who has a, you know, a math certification or something like that. That's certainly not always the case. It all depends on what you're trying to do. I can imagine in cases, for example, I mean, we often think about you know, math fact practice or computations, but I could certainly think of occasions where if well prepared, or special education teachers could mediate a certain kind of problem solving, right? Could learn how to do that as well as sponsor the sort of classroom discussions and the, the, the presenting your rationale or thinking that's described in the RTI guide is something that could be part of that practice. So it, it, it can certainly vary by personnel, but we should also think about varying what the tasks are. You don't always need a full-blown uh, you know, math teacher doing some of this RTI work. Okay. That sounds like a, a good strategy and plan um, to consider. Uh, Jill mentioned that there are free interactive Singapore websites that use um, that she uses for remediation. So I wanted to make sure that I shared that um, with everyone. Um, let's see. Another question, um, and this was from earlier in the session. So Russell, you may also want to, um, you know, help provide an answer to this. Uh, Anne Marie says, so if they never did learn long division. So if they never learned long division, when would that learning take place? And that was back to our RTI discussion um, early on in the webinar. Okay, I'll give it a shot. Um, so probably uh, two possible answers. One is um, that um, they would just not really ever learn it well and use calculators or whatever on their functions on computers to do that. Um, another would be that if they if these interventions did succeed in middle school, once you have that level of uh, self-confidence in yourself in math, then backtracking could make sense. Um, but it's I think it's it's great to do, but it just it it isn't as important for making sense out of middle school and ninth grade math as some of these other things. Okay, thank you. Uh, that completes our list of questions, and I would like to give both of our speakers the opportunity to have some final comments. So, Dr. Gerson, I'll start with you and just ask if you have any uh, final comments that you'd like to make uh, before we wrap up this webinar. Um, no, nothing special comes to mind other than I think all we've done is open up areas for folks to think about and read some more about and look into. I think the idea of the criteria for evaluating intervention curricula is a good idea, and I think we both shared um, ways when John had it nicely uh, laid out there towards the end. Okay, and we did get a question from Lori. Uh, she wanted to know if there was an RTI guide specific to Maryland. Uh, she sees them for other states, but she wondered if there is one in general or one for Maryland. Do you know the answer to that? I I don't. I know some sta many states have RTI guidance documents or so, but I just don't know. Okay. Another question that just came in uh, from Leslie. When doing intervention, if you have a student who is behind in all subjects, what is best to give them um, intervention on? What what they should have known at the beginning of the year or what they are supposed to be currently learning? 
in in math, I would say um, that integrated approach that I was talking about would be the best thing to do. Because first of all, what that would do is potentially make their time in their regular, let's say, fourth grade math class useful, uh, rather than just catching up on all the second grade material and all. This might become the kind of student who needs a tier three intervention, which is much more intensive and usually is not as well coordinated with the core curriculum. And their policies are just emerging. But I would um, try that integrated approach first, for sure. And if it's not working with the student, then probably do more individualized, intensive work on foundations. OK. And um, the question about the RTI guide from Maryland, um, Lori wants to know, if there is not one from Maryland, where should she look for a general RTI guide? Which website could she find that information on? Well, well, for this particular one, it could be Google. Just simply Googling um, practice guides is all you need to do. And then they'll have the ones, the, the math RTI will be listed right there. Beyond that, there are some books on RTI. Um, there are articles. But I don't know of any guide. And I think a lot of state guidance documents are relatively bureaucratic and theoretical. I should I may be being too candid in saying that, but I don't know that they give you much in the way of hands on day to day stuff that I've seen. Okay. And Susan asked if we will be providing a list of resources that you've mentioned today. Um, is that something that I mean, I think that you've suggested they Google most of the information. <clears throat> and I guess um, what we could say is if you have specific questions on re specific resources, let us know, and we can provide you with that information. Yeah, that's, that's correct. The only limitation is if it's a commercial site, right. that this is a federal law precludes us recommending anything. but. Um, one one source, and I could, I could ship that over, is um, the the progressions that come with the Common Core could be very useful for thinking about RTI and math because they kind of explicitly show linkages of like a certain uh, theme from third grade through sixth grade. By theme, I mean a topic like uh, mm -hmm. understanding a rational number and operations with rational number. So okay. I can uh, ship that over, Lidota, to, to you, and you can um, you know, collate that together with anything else. OK. That would be great. So we will post um, the resources that he just mentioned. And um, otherwise, if you um, search for the ones that they described earlier and are unable to find things, please let us know, and we'll um, do our best to, con or to locate that information. One final question before we finish. Um, Carla asked if should intervention begin with the identified kindergarten students or wait until they enter the first grade? Oh, I think it should begin in kindergarten. And I mean, a lot of it can be fun things. It need not be very long. But it's just giving kids a sense of number, of counting. Uh, there'll be kids who don't know, you know, cardinality that don't know that the, if you want to know how much it is and you count and do one-to-one -one correspondence that um, the, the last number, you know, if you count and you go up to seven, that means you have seven objects. So that could be fun kind of things to do. Board games, as long as they're not in s circles, seem to work very well to build number sense. And uh, so that would be another kind of e easy to fit in. But I would start early if kids have weak number knowledge. Because you're not identifying or diagnosing them as disabled. And, but it, they're likely to fall behind the, the rest of the class. Um, and so I think it would be great. Maybe waiting till November or so to start in kindergarten. It takes little kids a while to just get oriented to period and that kind of thing. OK, thank you. And we do have a couple of other questions that are um, 
still coming in, and we will get those answers out to you. Again, if you want information um, as far as the recording or the slides, please visit the REL Appalachia um, website. We will be posting the information there. And Suzanne, if you would turn the slides back to me, I will go ahead and um, move on to the final slide, which is our um, slide to ask you to um, Please let us know what you thought of the webinar. Um, this link uh, is called, it, it will take you to our stakeholder feedback survey. And this allows you to give feedback on today's webinar event. And um, we certainly need that input. And we very much would appreciate um, if you could go to that link now and complete this so that we have your thoughts on the webinar event. Um, again, I'd like to thank, first off, our speakers for being with us, both Dr. Gersten and Dr. Woodward. I think that they provided us with a lot of information that's very helpful to us as we um, identify you know, struggling students and, and look for ways to help them in mathematics. We appreciate your time and, and your willingness to answer the questions and provide us with useful information. And I would also like to thank all of our participants for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we hope that um, the webinar was able to meet your goals for this time and um, provide you with um, additional information to help you as you deal with interventions in the classroom. So again, thank you to everyone for participating and for being on with us today. And please be sure to go to this link to, um, and we will email this link to you as well. But if you'd like to just do it right now while it's fresh in your mind, we ask you to visit this website and provide us with your feedback. So with that, again, thank you to our speakers. And have a nice evening. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.